Today, we're going to be talking about a culture of growing. But before we start on that, I want to tell you a little story, a little story about Sam. So it's Sunday morning and Sam is asleep in bed upstairs. And his mum calls up the stairs and says, Sam, time to get ready for church. Come on. Nothing. She calls up again. Sam, come on. We have this every Sunday. Get up. Come downstairs. I've got your breakfast on the table. I've ironed your shirt. We need to get to church. Nothing. So she goes in the room and opens the door. Now look, Sam, I'm telling you, you need to get up, come downstairs, have your breakfast, and go to church. You do this to me every single week. At which Sam puts the covers over his head like that. She's not happy. So she says, Sam, just tell me, why is it you don't like going to church? What is it about church that you don't like? And he thinks for a moment and he says, well, nobody likes me. I've got no friends. I'm Billy No Mate. And even last week, some of the teenagers were throwing things at me and calling me names. I don't want to go. And then he thinks for a moment and he says, Mum, give me one good reason why I should go to church. And she looks at him and she says, Sam, firstly, you're 43 years old. Secondly, you're the senior pastor. <laughs> what that's got to do with my preach, I don't know, but I just thought you'd like that story. <sighs> Believe it or not, Jubilee Church Wirral knows where it's going. It has a plan, it has a strategy, and it has a focus strategy. Dave and Rick and the team, they actually know what they're doing. Now that might come as a surprise to you, it might come as a surprise to them this morning, but they do know where they're going. But I'll tell you something they don't know. They don't necessarily know exactly how they're going to get there. You see, we as the believers, we as the church, have a mission. We have a mission and we have a method. Now, these two things must not be confused. The mission is where we're headed, where we're going. It's the goal. It's where we want to get to, okay? The method is how we get there. Now, the method is changeable. The method needs to be flexible. The mission doesn't change. And as a church, if we get mission and method confused, we start to get ourselves into a lot of trouble. What happens if we start to confuse mission with method? Well, what happens is that instead of the mission becoming sacred, the method becomes sacred. Oh, no, we can't change that. No, we've always done it this way. Oh, no, 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 no. This is how we do it. We're not starting up one of them. No way. Now, look, we can't stop doing that. We've always done that. We love doing that. We have to have a flexible method in order to achieve the mission, the goal, where we're going. When we first moved to Liverpool some 23, 24 years ago, something like that, we realized that where we'd bought our house was right on a major bus route. And I thought, great, I can use the bus routes to get all over the place. And so I can, it's brilliant, love it. But even though I looked up the buses and thought, yeah, I know that the 82 goes there, the 80 goes there, and that one goes there, and that one goes there. There were times when I got in a mess because I didn't always know exactly which way it was going. And I would get on one bus that I thought was going there and not realizing that its route into town was different from it than its route back from town. 
Plus, it's also very confusing when you think you've got it all sussed and then the 82 with the 82, and then the 82A comes along. And you, oh, the 82A does that, but it doesn't do that. I got in a mess, but I learned. I learned that I still wanted to go to that place, but that I would have to sometimes alter my route to get there. So what we're going to look at this morning is three ways, three areas for us all to address. Every single one of us. Leaders, if you don't consider yourself a leader, by the way, if you don't consider yourself a leader, when you're in New Frontiers, you probably will be a leader one day. Just thought I'd get that in. But whoever you are, we can all of us make this happen. So the first thing it starts with, this culture of growing, is you, me. It's all very well for us to sit here and say, well, the way the church needs to grow is X, Y, Z. But actually, nothing makes churches grow faster and better than growing Christians. So it actually starts not with all these wonderful things. And by the way, we do exactly the same things. They're great. Quiz nights and, I mean, uh, go-karting make a note of that for Liverpool. We need to do this. This sounds fun. All those things are great, and we need to keep doing them. But the starting place for church growth isn't here. The starting place is here. Because what is the church? I love coming to the Wirral. I love coming here. I love your building. I love your people. I love your heart. By the way, you've got the best welcome team I've ever met. They're awesome, seriously. Absolutely awesome. There's no way you could sneak in here unnoticed, is there? You, I mean, even James Bond couldn't sneak in here unnoticed. It's brilliant. So we are the church. You are the church. Whether you're in this building. In fact, this building is great and it serves a purpose, but this building is not the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. You, 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 me, you, you. Each one of us is the church and therefore it's up to us first of all to get ourselves right with God, not just to wait for the leadership team to do stuff. Growing Christians grow churches. I mean, if you get a plant, I, I love plants. I don't know about you, but I'm a bit of a green-fingered person. And I love growing vegetables and plants. And you know that if you put a plant in a pot and it's in the wrong conditions, I, I made a real faux pas a few weeks ago. I had a very big birthday recently. Yes, I was 21. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. And my friend gave me a beautiful orchid, a live orchid. And I thought, after a few months, it looked like it's outgrowing its pot. So I thought, I'll do what I always do. And, you know, I know quite a bit about plants. So I thought, I repotted this orchid into a bigger pot with good compost. Do you know what happened? The whole thing has died. And I'm dreading her coming around and seeing that there's no thing there. I didn't realize that orchids have to have very, very special environments to grow in, as do many plants. And it's the same with us as believers. We need to be in the right conditions to grow. Because if we're not in the right conditions, if we're not hearing the right stuff, if we're not hanging out with and being influenced by believers who are really going for the kingdom, if we are not in those conditions, do you know what's going to happen? It's going to be like my orchid. It's just going to go and get absolutely nowhere and it's going to wither. Plants never ever stay the same. Have you noticed that? They either thrive or they die. Thrive or die and that's the same with our faith. When we become Christians, we are rooted to Jesus. We are rooted in the vine, the vine that is Jesus. We're grafted onto him for all eternity. He is our strength. Salvation starts 
with us giving ourselves to Jesus. But do you know what? When you've given yourself to Jesus, it's not, well, that's it. I've done it. I'm sorted. That's the end goal. Do you know what? That's just the beginning. That is just the beginning. Now, I don't know how many of you here have got a driving license. Have um, a good half of you, good half of you have got a driving license. We, in recent years, have had, I don't want to call it the pleasure, we have had the opportunity of teaching both our children, who are now in their mid-late 20s, to drive. Nothing on this planet is more scary than going out in your car with your child when you haven't got dual control cars and them driving you. It really is frightening. What I'm trying to say here is that the DVLA tell you in all their information, in their website, they say to you, when you've learned to drive, when you're a new driver, that's the beginning. And what a lot of people do is they make the mistake of thinking, yay, I've passed my driving test. I am a fully fledged driver. No, what they're saying is that at this point, you are able to go out on your own without somebody accompanying you, but you are still learning. That's the same for us. That's the same for all of us. Please don't ever make the mistake of thinking, I'm sorted. I've got it. There is always more. And please understand that if we don't grow, we shrivel. I would challenge you today to think to yourself, am I the same believer that I was two years ago? And if not, just get somebody to pray with you. Just seek God and look to push yourself further forward because there is more, so, so much more. It's not just information that we have, you see. The Bible isn't just about information. Sometimes we think, well, I know the stuff. I know this information about Jesus. I know what he's done for me. But do you know what the Bible is mostly about? It's not about information. There's an awful lot of information in there. Yes, of course there is. We know that. But the primary reason the Bible is there isn't to give us information. It's to show us how to live. The Bible is living. The Bible is about us living the Christian life. Not just reading about it. Don't mishear me. Yes, we do need to get into the word. We do need to understand. We do need to grapple with scripture. That is really important. But it's worth nothing if we don't live it out. We've got to live it out. John 10, 10, sorry, John 10, chapter, um, chapter 10, verse 10, tells us about living abundantly. Not understanding the word of God full stop, but understanding who Jesus is, what his message is, and living abundantly. And friends, we need to get that into our heads. That's what our mission is, to live abundantly for Jesus and to make disciples for the kingdom. Making disciples for the kingdom is our goal. Which brings us on to point two. So that's the me, us, individuals. Number two is the church. Jubilee Church Wirral. What a great place this is. And as we've already said, the church isn't this building. The church is each one of you. We are the church, each one of us. It's not these four walls. And when people come in, when people come in, do you know what the first thing is that they want? They won't realize this. They won't be aware of this. They probably wouldn't be able to write down if somebody said, now what do you want coming here? They probably wouldn't be able to say it. But they do not come in saying, I want to find Jesus. I want to find the living God who's going to save me. No. They come in and in their heart, they are first of all looking for people who will listen to them, people who will understand them, people who will love them and accept them where they're at. That is the very first thing people need. 
They want their needs met. They want to be heard. They want to be valued. They want to be affirmed. And that is our starting point. When people feel their needs are met and they're being heard and they're being loved, then they'll be open to everything else that we have to offer them. And do you know what? There's this, there's a message as well that we want you to hear. It's about Jesus and how he can transform your life. But we've realized this in Liverpool recently. So we've started um, probably at the beginning of COVID, and I'm sure you're doing similar things here too. We've started just meeting the needs of people in the neighborhood. Meals, clothes, shopping, telephone calls, friendship, you name it, we've tried to do it. And you know what? People are feeling loved. People are feeling heard. They're feeling accepted. And then on the back of that, they're coming in through the door. Not because we've gone out and said, oh, please come to our church on a Sunday morning. No, because we, the church, have gone out to them. And that's the difference. People will respond to culture before they respond to the gospel. That's why it's so important when people walk through that door, and you are doing it brilliantly, just love them and serve them. And not just when they walk in, do it during the meeting, do it after the meeting, do it anytime. Love people. Now, it's sometimes difficult in um, church life to know where to put your energies. And it's right as church leaders to sometimes make choices where you're going to put your efforts. And you may say, well, we want to do a kid's work. We want to do um, a soup kitchen outreach. We want to do this. We want to do this. That's good. Have a go at them. Have a go. Where churches often fall down is by insisting on doing that even if it's not producing fruit. And yet the weird thing is that God's bringing in people over there. And sometimes, no, no, it doesn't matter about those. We are focused on this group of people here. Do you know what? Look for where God is already blessing you. And I spoke to Dave yesterday and I said, tell me, where is Jubilee Church Wirral being blessed? And he said, with youth. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Half your church have gone through that door. We would love it if we had half the number that you've got of youth. Brilliant. You are massively, massively being blessed by sort of children, youth, teenagers. Don't, don't despise that. Don't underestimate that. In that room there, or whichever rooms, that you've got so many rooms here, whichever rooms they are, you have got many, many of tomorrow's leaders. Don't underestimate that. It's awesome. And you're also being blessed with lots of mature people, people who are pre-retirement, post-retirement. Brilliant. Don't underestimate that. My word, if we could really tap into some of the time and availabilities and skills and energies and the knowledge and the wisdom of some of our mature people, wow, our churches would take off. Do not underestimate yourself if you are over a certain age. Do not underestimate younger people what these mature people have to offer. It's awesome. Now, we're not going to please all the people all the time. So if you had a radio station and it played a third country and western music, a third hip-hop is there such a thing as hip-hop music still i haven't a clue i really don't know well let's say hip-hop i'm sure we've all heard of it i haven't a clue what it means though and if we had a third classical music do you think that station would get many listeners no it probably wouldn't people like to go where they as a people group are feeling nurtured so for that reason and this is slightly controversial i know for that reason, it's okay for church leaders to focus on particular people groups. In Liverpool, we are very blessed with students because we're surrounded in Liverpool, as you know, by universities. We are blessed with students. 
So we put a lot of our time and energy there. We are blessed also with many asylum seekers, people from other nations who, for whatever reason, are passing through, if it's only for a few weeks, a few months, or some of them have stayed. That's where God is blessing us. So when God gives you blessing in an area, don't argue with it. Don't argue with it. Have a think and think, where are we being blessed? And put your energies into there because that's where God wants to use you. That's where God wants to bless you. Now, one of the other things that people um, are really, have really been struggling with, and this has been highlighted during COVID, is um, the whole thing about online church and the digital age. And I am not what's called a digital native. I'm a digital alien. Um, so I cannot just pick up an iPad like probably all those teenagers can and go blah, 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 and sort stuff out. Yes, I'm on Facebook. I only use it occasionally. Yes, I use my laptop a lot for certain things. But the digital age, whether we like it or not, is here to stay, isn't it? It's here to stay. And when people are using the internet, they are inundated with information. They are hungry, not just for information, because they can get information, information from all sorts of places, information. What people are hungry for today is something reliable, something trustworthy, something they can put their hope in and something that they know will not let them down. And that's big. We need to recognize that. And for that reason, I would say we need to embrace technology. We've started doing something uh, rather new in our church since I preached this back in October. Um, and we've started using Facebook oh, what's it called? Facebook ads, I think it is. Now, some of you will know what that means, but it's where you put an ad in Facebook and somehow, I don't know how, by the magic, not magic, but magic in that sense of technology, it targets people around our building. I really, really do not understand how it works. Um, but it does that. We started a Pilates group and we put it out on this Facebook thing and do you know what happened? Within the first 20 minutes, we got more phone calls than we knew what to do with, and we had to take it down. We had to take it off the website. It's awesome. We've got a waiting list this long of people who want to come to Pilates. Don't despise the digital age. We need to respond to the opportunities that are given to us. Yes, we have vision, and it's great that the leadership team have a vision, and they aim in that direction. But I'll tell you what, these guys are brilliant because what they do is they aim for discipling people to know Jesus and for kingdom to be displayed here on earth. They aim for that. But what they do is they're flexible. And they say, well, let's try this. Well, let's try this. Well, let's uh, leave that because that one hasn't really done much. We'll leave that one and we'll go on and try this. Don't please think that everything is down to the leadership team. Every single one of us, every single one of us, front row, back row, whatever, we all have a responsibility to help push things forward. By living is my mic still on? Is it okay? Oh, sorry, I thought it had just gone off for a moment. Um, by living, kingdom living, not just in these four walls, but out there, out there. You've got a coffee afternoon. You've got some asylum seeker drop-in days, I think, here. And you've also got, you're working with CAP debt advice. Is that right? You've got so many things going on. That's brilliant. Keep doing it, and where God's blessing you, put more energy into that. Okay, here's a question for you. We're still on church. We're still on um, Jubilee Church Wirral. Where did Jesus do most of his miracles? Was it inside the synagogues and the temples? No. He did them mainly out there in the marketplace, didn't he? 
what we would say is out on the streets. That's where Jesus did his miracles because that is where kingdom is. Kingdom is wherever the believers are. Kingdom isn't just coming into a holy four walls on a Sunday morning and wearing your Sunday best and acting very proper, properly, correctly, and then going out and trying to be good. Kingdom is what you do when you're in the bus queue. Kingdom is what you do when you're in the supermarket. Kingdom is what you do at work. Kingdom is what you do with your family. Kingdom is what you do when you're on your own and nobody else is looking. That's kingdom. So, what they did was, they had Jesus out and about in the marketplace and Jesus, first of all, met people's needs. He met people's needs. And then friends and people who'd seen what was going on would say, come along, come along. Look what's happened to my friend. He's been changed. He's been changed. Word of mouth, word of mouth. And our word of mouth today can be the internet. The main need people had was for a savior. That was the main need. Where, here's a question for you all, where is today's marketplace? I've probably made it a bit hard for you, actually, because I've, I've kind of already answered it. Go on, Andrew. Social media. Do you know what? It took the Liverpool church about two minutes to get there. We went through Tesco. We went city centre. We went the library. It is social media. Is the new marketplace. Now, don't switch off at this point if you're over a certain age because you still have a part to play in this. You still have the wisdom and the personal contact with people. Social media is our marketplace and we need to be seen out there. So if we try and discard the digital age and say we don't really need that because it's not real ministry, then we're putting up a barrier to the kingdom. We need digital age and we need you at the bus stop, you at the supermarket, you with somebody at work. We need both. Jesus targeted his ministry effectively. Paul went to the Gentiles. Peter went to the Jews. In the 1940s, um, by the way, I do not remember the 1940s because I wasn't born, just in case you're thinking. I was. In the 1940s, the um, America started their space program by dreaming. Wouldn't it be great to put a man on the moon? Wouldn't it be fantastic? So they had this goal to aim towards putting a man on the moon. Now, they started a plan. They started a plan in the 1940s, the 1950s. And then what they had to do was they had to develop it and change the method. Change the method, the mission stays the same. Change the method, the mission stays the same. If they had tried to use the technology they had in the 40s to get to the moon, they'd probably barely have lifted that far off the ground. They had to embrace new technology. They had to change their method to get to the moon. And yes, I do remember the man, the first moon landing. I remember age seven being brought downstairs at three o'clock in the morning not having a blind bit of interest in it, but I do remember it now, and being told, you need to watch this, this is history in the making, and watching Man on the Moon. That's a great example of mission and method. But, you might say, isn't it dangerous going on the internet? Yes, going on the internet can be incredibly dangerous, as we all know. Driving a car can be dangerous. Rocket fuel that takes rockets to the moon is dangerous. But in the right hands and handled with wisdom, all these things are incredibly useful to us. So what we need to do as a church, Jubilee Church Wirral, what we need to do is find a way, because if we don't find a way, we find excuses. So I want to challenge you today to think, about finding ways through, not just excuses. And finally, just to wrap up, the third little part, well, it's not little, it's actually the biggest, but it's kingdom. So we've got self, we've got the church, and we've got kingdom. 
Kingdom is the big picture. Or as they'd say in McDonald's, it's go large. Do you want fries with that? Do you want to upsize your drink? Do you want to go large? Yes, as believers, we need to go large. This is kingdom we're talking about. There's a theologian called Dan Ryland who sums it up so succinctly in one sentence. He says, the goal of ministry is not to be busy. It's to be productive for kingdom, resulting in changed lives for eternity. Love that. Matthew 16, verse 18 says, I will build my church. The I is Jesus. Does that mean we absolve ourselves of responsibility and say, well, Jesus has said he'll build his church. Therefore, actually, I can just sit back with my arms folded and not really have a lot to do with it because it's going to happen anyway. He's sovereign. No, it doesn't mean that. We are expressly given commands in the Bible. Go. Go. How many times does it say in the Bible, go? It's organic. It's changing. It's living. It's breathing. It's kingdom. And we either choose to stay in maintenance mode for you techies out there, or for us who are slightly older, comfort zone. Comfort zone, maintenance mode, whatever you want to call it. Are we in either of those? Or are we going on the front foot? Mark Twain, the author, said, the man who grabs a cat by the tail learns 50% more about cats than the man who doesn't. Now this, by the way, do not try at home, please. <laughs> What that basically says is, have a go. Have a go. Because you learn. All the best inventions in the world, whether it's technology, whether it's food, whether it's electronics, whether it's physics, whether it's agriculture, whatever it is, no invention, or probably very, very few inventions, just happen just like that. They all started with lots and lots and lots of fails, except they're not fails. Previous fails is what makes things happen. So if you're looking around and thinking, well, the church has failed here, it's failed there, and it's not doing very well here, do you know what the answer is? Get off your backside and do something about it. Do something. Say, do you know what? That's a fail. We've learned from that. What did we learn? Yeah, we learned X, Y, Z. Right, let's go and apply A, B, C instead and have a go there and see what happens. We need to constantly be discarding, trying, adapting, reshaping in everything we do. We need to be organic as a church. Proverbs 18.15 says, the wise person is open to new ideas. In fact, anybody know what the next bit is? He looks for them. So please don't come here expecting the leadership team to do everything. I've known all these guys on the leadership team for years, sort of 20, nearly 25 years. They slog their guts out. They slog their guts out. Please, please get behind them. Please support them. Please encourage them. Please, if you have something you think needs maybe altering, rather than going up and saying, by the way, that was rubbish. I really don't like that. You need to stop doing that. Please go up to them and say, hey, do you know what? I love the way we do this, and I love the way we do this. I'm just wondering if maybe we could add this in or tweak this a bit. Please encourage them. And please don't just say, I want you to do this. Please say, I'd like us as a church to do this. How can I help make this happen? Please take it on the shoulders. We need to be people who say, even if... Not what if. Well, what if that doesn't work? What if this doesn't happen? What if this person doesn't like it? What if this all goes pear-shaped? What if, what if, what if? Don't say what if. Say even if. Even if this goes wrong, we'll get up again and go again. Even if this doesn't work, 
no shame in it, we'll go again. Even if we um, went to Southport a few weeks ago on the train on, um, on our day off, and it's a very straight train ride up from Egbeth, where we live, up to Southport. And we weren't too worried about the times of the trains coming back, because they're every 20 minutes. So we didn't have to time it too accurately. It wasn't a huge problem. We, um, so we arrived back at Southport Station, ready to get our train home. And the end destination of the train is Hunts Cross. So we look for trains that say Hunts Cross on them, and we know that's the one that goes through Egbeth, where we get off to Hunts Cross. So we arrived there and we looked on the big display board and went down and went down and we saw the next train to Hunts Cross was in one minute and it was on platform two. So we checked it again, Hunts Cross, one minute, platform two. Right, we did, we ran, seriously, yes, we ran and we got there and we blipped through the barrier and we saw the train on the station, the, sorry, yeah, the, the train at the platform, and there were actually four platforms, sort of one, two, three, four, like that. So we were talking one, two, two, like that. And we saw this train there, doors wide open. There we are, platform two. Literally ran, jumped in through the open doors, and as we sat down, we heard the doors going beep, 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 you know, meaning we're about to close. Except the doors didn't close, and the beeping stopped. And then we noticed that the train beside us was pulling away. And we thought, hang on a minute, what's going on here? This is plan one, we got on platform, platform two, da, 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 da. So we sat there a minute and we thought, no, we've definitely got this wrong. So we got off and we had a look at the board again. Yeah, that bit's right. And then we looked and we saw that these um, platforms were labelled, instead of being labelled left to right, which you think would be logical, wouldn't you? You'd think it would be platform one, two, three, four. Oh no, Mersey Rail in their wisdom. One, two, three, four. So we've got on a train um, a platform three. Anyway, it wasn't the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination. But the bottom line is we knew where we were headed. We were headed to Hunts Cross and we had to adjust a bit. We had to make adjustments. So what I want to encourage you to do this morning, church, is to take on board that you as an individual, each one of you as an individual, has responsibility for not just growing the church in numbers, because this is not a numbers game. Yes, we want to see the church flourish and grow in numbers, but we want the church to flourish and be healthy we want it to be a strong church, and you are awesome. And I just love what you're doing here. But all of us can go large, can't we? All of us. So I want to encourage you to understand where it starts. I want to encourage you to bring a culture of growth, not just here on a Sunday morning, but out there in the marketplace. I want to encourage you as leaders or techies, if people are good with tech stuff, help develop that for some of these leaders who may not quite be so techy. I don't know, you're probably more techy than me, Danielle. But do it. Do kingdom. Live kingdom out in the street. Live kingdom everywhere you go. And here are three options for you to go away and think about. If you imagine that we're on a boat and we're on a journey and we know where you're heading, we know where we're heading, you get all sorts of different people on boats, don't you? You get all sorts of different people everywhere you go. But essentially, broadly speaking, there are three types of people in a church and you need to decide which one you are. You're either somebody who is riding in the boat, which is good. It's good if you're there for the ride. That's good. Or you're somebody who maybe rocks the boat. Are you somebody who rocks the boat and slows things down by causing problems, by not supporting those at the helm saying, we're going forward, we're going forward? Or are you somebody who is rowing the boat, actually saying, yeah, I'm going to get stuck in. I'm going to use my energies. I haven't got a lot of skills, but I'm prepared to learn. I want to get stuck in. I want to row this boat. Do you ride? Do you rock? 
or do you row? Which are you? Because growing people grow the church and grow the kingdom. So that's essentially it. And what, what I'd like to do now, if it's okay, I want to shake things up just a wee bit. Um, I've been standing here for what? Oh, probably 40 minutes. Um, I've been, and you've all had a lovely comfy sit down for 40 minutes. So what I'd like you to do, if you're able, and if you're comfortable to do so, I'd like you, um, in fact, could, while I'm doing this, can the band um, come back? Thanks, Vern. Um, and you just feel free, Vern, just to play quietly in the background, whatever, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is challenge you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything scary, don't worry. But I just, we need to declare who we are, don't we? It, we, we need to actually sometimes make a declaration, nail our colors to the mask and say, this is me, this is who I am. So if you consider yourselves a member of Jubilee Church Wirral and you want to stand with the leaders and say, we are on board with you and we want this church to move forward, I'd like you just to stand now. Just stand as a sign of declaration. If, you, if, if it doesn't sit comfortably with you or if you're not able to stand, that's fine. We're totally under grace here totally under grace. No one's going to point to you, pick you out. No one's going to say, what about this? What about this? I just want you to m sort of stand there. If you're comfortable, put your arms out or up or just in front of you. This is not something that we do just to be showy on a Sunday morning. When we put our arms out or put our arms up, it's a sign of surrender. And if we don't surrender to the living God, then he can't work in us. So if you feel comfortable, I would love you, while Vern's just playing there in the background, I would love you to raise your hands, close your eyes, and just surrender yourself before God. And I'm going to pray for you. Father God, I thank you for all these people here in Jubilee Church Wirral who are committed to the goal and the mission. I thank you for the many, many people who pour themselves out week in, week out for the sake of the kingdom. And Lord, we're not playing a numbers game, but we want to see your kingdom grow. We want to see a healthy, strong, thriving church which starts with individuals in their personal, quiet space and lives, what they do in secret. Lord, look down on your people and pour your favor down. And we ask, Lord, for blessing upon blessing for this church. And we ask that people would surrender themselves to you that people would go home today and say, yeah, I need to uh, bring myself before God afresh and maybe drop that, leave that, maybe pick that up and do that. And we ask, Lord, for favor. Favor, Lord Jesus, favor on this church. We speak the favor of God over you, the favor of God over Jubilee Church Wirral. And we say, pour down your kingdom blessing now. Amen. <laughs>